This module will introduce you to evaluating a full mouth radiographic examination with particular emphasis on the technical quality and anatomic coverage. In subsequent modules, you will learn how to evaluate caries, periodontal disease, and periapical pathology. This image demonstrates the layout of a full mouth radiographic examination that we use at UCLA. Make sure that you are familiar with the location of the periapical and the bite wing projections and the locations of the radiographs from the various anatomic sites. Periapical radiographs should show the entire length of the root and at least 2 millimeters of the surrounding periapical bone. Bite wing radiographs must demonstrate the interproximal surfaces of teeth with less than one third overlap of the adjacent enamel. Additionally, you must be able to see the height of the alveolar crest. Note any abnormalities that might be incompletely imaged on this examination. In these cases, you will need to prescribe panoramic or CT imaging as needed so that you can encompass the entire pathology. On this examination, you will notice that we have anatomic coverage going from the right maxillary tuberosity to the left maxillary tuberosity and from the right retromandibular region to the left retromandibular region. Now that we have defined the anatomic coverage, the next step is to identify all of the teeth on the radiographic examination. Note that the teeth are imaged on multiple radiographs and this is important. This allows you to confirm or rule out a suspected pathology that you might see on one image but not on the other. And secondly, also allows you to look at radiographs of teeth from different angles. Determine if there are any missing teeth, if there are any teeth that may be impacted but are not visualized on the radiographic examination. And finally, if there are any supernumerary teeth. Now that we have completed the overall assessment, the next step is to look at the individual radiographs in more detail. It's good to have a standard sequence in which you will view the various radiographic images. Typically, I start by viewing the periapical radiographs of the maxilla from the right maxillary tuberosity over to the left maxillary tuberosity. I then continue with the periapical radiographs of the mandible, starting from the mandibular left retromolar region moving across the mandible to the right retromolar region. I then end off by looking at the bite wings in concert with the periapical radiographs from the posterior regions. A standard sequence allows you to apply the same rigor and completeness to all of the cases that you will evaluate. Now let's start with the radiographs of the right posterior maxilla. The first step is identification of the teeth. Make sure that you correctly identify the teeth accounting for any unerupted or missing teeth. Evaluate the crowns of the teeth. You should see an intact cap of enamel, which is more radiopaque than the underlying dentin. The dentinoenamel junction should be a sharp interface. The radio density of the dentin should be homogeneous. In subsequent modules, you will learn radiographic interpretation of caries. Evaluate the restorations and the zone of dentin adjacent to the restorations. Metallic restorations will appear much more radiopaque than composite restorations. Evaluate the zone of dentin adjacent to the restorations. This is important to detect recurrent caries. Also consider that the radiolucency under a restoration may be due to a liner and not due to recurrent caries. Additional details on this will be discussed in the module on radiographic interpretation of caries. Next, evaluate the pulp chambers and pulp canals. Remember that there's considerable variation in the anatomy of the pulp. Evaluate the length of the roots and the crown root ratio. Evaluate the morphology of the roots to identify any areas of root resorption or any areas of dilacerations, which are bends or kinks within the root. This is especially important if you are contemplating endodontic treatment on those teeth. Next, trace the periodontal ligament space and the lamina dura around the length of the roots. Note that for multi-rooted teeth, you will see superimpositions of the periodontal ligament space onto the root. Remember that the projection of the lamina dura as a distinct radiopaque line is dependent on the beam traversing through a certain thickness of the cortical bone.
Note how the roots shift between the projections and you can apply the buckle object rule to identify superimposed roots and superimposed canals. For example, note how the superimpositions of the buckle and the palatal roots changes between the two images. In particular, this is evident on the first premolar and the first molar. Next, evaluate the anatomic structures in this region. This includes the maxillary sinus. The maxillary sinus should be radiolucent and is superimposed over the adjacent bone. The floor of the maxillary sinus appears as a sharp white corticated line that is distinct and often undulating between the roots of the teeth. In particular, evaluate for any thickening of the mucosa along the floor of the maxillary sinus, which may indicate sinus disease. Remember that in edentulous areas, the sinus often extends into and pneumatizes the alveolar bone. Also visible on this radiograph is the hard palate or floor of the nasal cavity. The zygomatic process of the maxilla, which appears as a radiopaque U-shaped structure, Often, it may be superimposed over the maxillary molars and can obscure details. Next, we will move on to the anterior maxilla. Note that the anterior maxillary radiographs are made with a size 1 sensor. The first step is identification of the teeth. Make sure that you appropriately identify the teeth, accounting for any missing teeth or unerupted teeth. Next, evaluate the crowns. Identify the radiopaque cap of enamel the uniformly radio dense dentin and any morphological variations. In this particular case, you see tooth number 10, which has a prominent cingulum, which is a common anatomic variant. Next, evaluate the roots. Look at the length of the roots, the crown root ratio, and the morphology of the roots and evaluate for any root resorptions or dilacerations. Next, evaluate the pulpal morphology and evaluate for any areas of pulpal calcifications. Note that the pulpal morphology of single rooted teeth is much more easy to visualize. Trace the periodontal ligament space and the lamina dura around the length of the roots. Note that in the regions of the canines and premolars, there will be superimposition of the roots of the adjacent teeth. Anatomic structures in this region include the nasal cavity and the nasal cavity floor, the intermaxillary suture, and the incisive foramen. Considerable variability in the anatomy of the incisive foramen. In some cases, it may appear as a distinct radiolucency. In our patient here, it appears somewhat less prominent. So identify the anterior nasal spine seen as a triangular radiopacity adjacent to the nasal floor. The soft tissue of the nose is superimposed over the anterior maxilla and is visualized as a soft tissue shadow. We then move on to the left maxillary posterior region and essentially you will go through the same sequence that we did on the right side. Identify the teeth, evaluate the crowns and roots, evaluate the pulp space, outline the roots and identify the periodontal ligament and lamina dura. Also identify any anatomic structures including the maxillary sinus, the floor of the maxillary sinus and the zygomatic process of the maxilla. With that, we would have completed the analysis of the dentomaxillofacial region of the maxilla extending from the tuberosity of one side to the tuberosity of the other side. Using a systematic approach, we evaluated the teeth, the pulp, the surrounding periapical bone, and the adjacent anatomic structures.